Good morning. I welcome you to the first ever Research from Start to Publish workshop for the Physical Sciences, Engineering, and Mathematics sponsored by Cornell University Library. Thank you all so much for coming today. I'm introducing the session entitled Scientific Writing, Publishing, and Presenting, a panel discussion by faculty journal editors. We have three panelists today, all of whom are professors with extensive experience as authors, editors, reviewers, and presenters, and I'm sure you're all here today because those are roles that you're either in or would like to know more about or to move into, and so we'll all know a lot more by the end of this great panel's talk. We're gonna talk about how to increase one's chances at getting an article accepted, common author mistakes, tips on improving conference presentations, and to take your questions at the end. Shane Henderson, Professor and Director, School of Operations, Research, and Information Engineering. Professor Henderson is Editor-in-Chief of St Stochastic Systems, which is an open access journal, as well as part of the INFORMED journal family. INFORMED stands for Institute for Operations Research and Management Sciences. Matt Miller, Professor, Sibley School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and Director of in situ at Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source. He is on the Editorial Advisory Board for International Journal of Petite. And finally, Anil Nirod, Goldwyn Smith Professor of Mathematics and Editorial Board Member of dozens of journals and books, including Annals of Mathematics and Artificial Intelligence, Mathematical and Computer Modeling, and Documenta Mathematica. One of the original founders of the Cornell Computer Science Department, he was Chair of Mathematics from 82 to 87, and director of the Mathematical Sciences Institute at Cornell from 87 to 97. Professor Nerode is believed to be the longest serving teaching faculty member at Cornell, having arrived in 1959, 60 years ago. We are very fortunate that they have taken time to come today. Look forward to hearing what they have to say. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you very much. Um, I have here, hopefully all of you got a copy of the schedule for today and tomorrow, actually, so today is on it. There are extra copies out in the lobby if you need to see those. And just it's just reminding you again the names of the professors that we have this morning. And even though you may be in a subject area that doesn't fit in this group, I'm, I'm very, very sure you're going to learn some very interesting information about how articles get accepted or rejected by various journals. And it, 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 go, it transcends the, the disciplines, actually. Um, so here are five questions that I came up with. I doubt if I'll get a chance to get to all these questions today, but um, I'm just putting them out there. Uh, and I'm going to start then with the first one. Uh, so I'll ask the question, and then if each of you can answer, um, maybe up to five minutes each, I have a stop sign that I'll flash if you go too long. Um, so the first question is, how does one increase one's chances at getting an article accepted? Who would like to start? Well, I, I can jump in. Go on. So yeah, uh, Shane Henderson. Um, so I think uh, the first principle here <coughs> is that getting an article published is, is a good goal, but it's not really the goal. I think the goal is to do good work that has impact and impact can mean different things in different fields and and so i rec recognize that we're all coming from a broad variety of fields here so i don't pretend to know what impact means in your discipline in mine it means changing the way something is done or the way that somebody would uh, do something in practice but it can also mean mathematical impact as well so something that looks really cool from the mathematical perspective so uh, aim for impact first once you feel like you've got something that's really worthwhile and that you're, you know, you're proud of the work, then, then it's time to submit it. And I think the biggest thing that I would recommend uh, going through this is develop a thick skin. So I, I guess I heard, I didn't manage to attend, sorry, but I heard about the uh, session this morning. I mean, if a, if a Nobel laureate is getting those kinds of reviews, welcome to the rest of the world for the rest of us, right? So <laughs> yikes. Uh, so a bit of a thick skin. Um, so when you receive those reviews, uh, maybe take them, you know, you've got to list, you've got to look for the messages in, in those reviews. There's uh, probably some uh, legitimate comments that you should be paying attention to. Uh, and when you have prepared a, a, a response, 
you know, you want to be able to respond to each of the things that are raised, even if you just say this, this point is not relevant because of blah, 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 but you should have a polite, full, uh, sorry, a polite and respectful response to, to these kinds of uh, comments that are brought up by referees. And, and then as a sort of a final tidbit, and then I'll be quiet, um, I think it's actually very important that we do not adopt the culture that we see have seen in some of those comments from referees ourselves. I mean, we all want to receive professional, courteous reports. Certainly, I want to receive those kinds of reports. It can, it's okay for them to be critical, but they should be critical from the perspective of the work itself and not some sort of personal attack. So make sure that's not you. And one of the reasons that I say that is that I, as, a, as an editor, am looking at the reports that I'm receiving from the people uh, who I ask to be referees or associate editors. And where I see unprofessional kind of uh, reports, I go back to them and say, this is unacceptable. And I remember that. And I remember that when it comes time to evaluate that person for promotion or tenure. So uh, I'm not uh, you know, moving on some vindictive mission, but if I have somebody who has a pattern of that kind of behavior, yes, I will bring it up. So um, that's kind of like the stick side. The carrot is we all want reports that are about the material that we've written that are uh, on topic and, and really delivered in a professional manner. So I do hope that you will learn from those kinds of reports that you've seen in the way that uh, the opposite direction. You're not going to deliver reports like that. Stick with the material itself. Um. I would um, echo Shane's uh, early points uh, about, you know, do good work, you know, and then, and then the publication part um, is then the next step. I tell my students that it really didn't happen. You know, it was a figment of your imagination until it's published. Um, and I think that's a, um, that's sort of a, uh, uh, one of the, 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 uh, the ways of thinking about your work. Um, so with that in mind, um, realize that, that that getting you know that it's, it's 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 really binary it's much more binary than you think i i believe you you you'd like to get your work published and so in terms of accommodating um referees in terms of of uh, um again I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, how we personally do it here and how we how we, how we personally advise our students i am uh, i'm i'm someone who will probably bend over backwards to um, uh, address each comment um, and do it in a way that 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 you keep in mind the mission. The mission is to get your work published. The mission is to get you know the the, the substance that you get in the, into a journal. There may be there may be some things that that a, that a referee is calling for. Uh, you have to decide you know what parts of those do you really want to defend with your you know uh, with with the, the the possibility of not having it published in that particular journal. Because that's often what, you know, again, not, not all referees are as, are as open-minded and um, um, uh, kind and gentle as, as we all are. And so a lot of, some, <laughs> some referees will actually, that, that it becomes, it, it'll become a thing going back and forth. The next thing you know, you're two years down the road and you're still going back and forth. And so that I think is, that's, that's probably uh, uh, one of the worst things can happen. So be polite, uh, you know, if, if, it's, if it's not, you know, uh, 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 worth, you know, uh, it, pick out the things that you, you really are, uh, that really are worth fighting for. And if you need to fight for it, again, at this point in your careers, probably you're, you're not doing this by yourself. And so your, your advisors are, are hopefully uh, uh, playing a role. So I would say that, that um, pick your battles there and, uh, and get it published. Get your, get the thing, get the, the essence of it published. The second thing I would say that the, the, um, as a reviewer, uh, you know, the, you write a good story. You know, this is all about stories, I, I believe. You, you know, if, if, I, if I get a report, so there's a technical paper and then it, and a report. If I get a report, I said, it sounds like a report. I'm, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't spend a lot of time on that as a reviewer. And so think about writing a good story. What would you like to read? You know, have that be a compelling, have that, 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 will, that will often carry the day. Good writing, you know, I mean, grammar, all that stuff, that, that all really does matter. You know, especially a reviewer who is, who is busy as, 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 as you are, or as we are, that's, that makes a difference. You know, I, I really, I, I, will, I will probably, 
let weak science go by sometimes for a good story, personally. So those would be like the two things I would probably emphasize. So I put it in a somewhat different way in order to add uh, some content to what beyond what they've said. What I do uh, is tell, advise my students to find the journals which might care about their papers. That's the first thing. You don't choose the wrong journal. If, if the journal is disjoint from an interest from the uh, area in which you wish to work, you're sort of crazy to send something into that journal. Second thing is to look at the editorial board of the journal and in particular exactly how it's handled. It's quite different between the journals which are handled by the societies where the uh, editors are really not uh, committed to anything other than what their journal is supposed to cover. They have no emotional content of, other than making a good journal. And uh, they make a great effort to be extremely objective versus journals which are in special areas where they're trying to push that particular area. And it better be that your paper fits somewhat into that category. This is all meta advice because I actually look into who runs the journals before I let my students send their, their papers out. The next thing, which is entirely different, is uh, think of this as uh, giving a lecture in which you're trying to hold the attention of the reader. In this case, the reader is the editor or the person who does the uh, uh, refereeing. You have to start the paper out by saying what you did and why you think it fits into their uh, the milieu. In other words, if you found a niche or a corner which seems to be productive, try to explain why it's productive in, in language which is actually accessible to every last reader of the journal. There should, that's a missing paragraph in the beginning of most of the papers that I see. They don't tell you what the, why you should bother to go on to the second paragraph. The next thing is simply if there's a main result or a main a thing that you're getting across, give the technical statement of it in complete detail in a place where the people can find it in the paper, either near the beginning or at the end. Because the first thing the referee does and the first thing the editor does is to look at the beginning to find out what they think you're doing and to look at the end to see a summary of what you're doing. And I noticed that that is not, the, <laughs> There are a countless number of papers that cannot be evaluated positively in, in those respects. But these are the same principles that would apply to writing a, a paper in literature or in uh, uh, history. Uh, you actually have to tell people why they should be interested and send it to people who might conceivably be interested. Oh, good. Let me go to the next question here. Thank you. Um, what are some common author mistakes? Want me to kick it off and you guys fix it? Yeah. No sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah. Actually, I think we've already touched on on a couple of these, and I I, I absolutely agree. So uh, probably the biggest thing is not sufficiently motivating the work. So I would agree with that. Uh, so there's this, um, and I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, but catechism or catechism? Catechism. Catechism. Thank you. Yeah, coming from New Zealand, I have no clue how to pronounce some of these. Um, so, so what, what are you going to do? What, what problem are you going to solve? What, what's your contribution? Why is it important? Why should somebody care? How is what you're doing differently from uh, what other people have done? Um, how is it better? How will you know if you've succeeded? Uh, these are sort of principles that pervade all scientific writing, I think. And <clears throat> You should be thinking about those questions, and it's you. It's Hale Meyer's cate catechism, I guess. Uh, that's the one you, that I'm sort of paraphrasing here poorly. But uh, go through that. Make sure you've answered those questions for your work uh, before you submit. Um, I definitely think that uh, yeah, not sufficiently motivating one's work, and, and I'm guilty of this as much as anyone. I get excited about the stuff that I'm doing. It's sort of obvious to me why somebody should care about my work, and I haven't done enough in the introduction to make it fair. There's a, there's a person I know who actually does this very, very well, though. His name is Dimitris Bitsimis. He's at MIT. He's very, very good at marketing his own work. And almost without fail, at the start of every one of his papers, you'll find something like, we view the, the primary contributions of this paper as being, and there is a bulleted list. He is really just, you know, taking a hammer and smacking me over the head with it to say, look, this is why this stuff is good. 
And, and so it's, it's impossible for me to miss that as an editor of the paper. So uh, thinking about things that way, you, you're, not, you're not trying to bludgeon readers, you know, <laughs> literally, but, but you do want to make it very, very clear uh, what, you're, what you're providing. And then the, the other mistake that I'll often see is just a lack of positioning of one's work relative to other literature. So um, a friend of mine calls this defensive writing, and I'm not sure I want to advocate it, but it, it certainly makes a difference, I think, in terms of getting papers accepted. How does your work fit into the broader scientific uh, endeavor in your field? So how does, it, how does it advance, not just the spe specific area in which you're working, but also maybe some related areas? And this gives you a chance to cite some great papers, the papers of, of, of uh, people that might be referees for your, for your paper. It sounds awful to say that. Uh, I don't mean it completely that way so, so, uh, uh, so blatantly, but I do believe that uh, you do have to demonstrate that you've read uh, other people's work and you know how your work fits into that, uh, into that overall field. So uh, that is an opportunity for you to do that. And at the same time, you're showing that you do appreciate the related areas and, uh, and understand how your work advances that. Yeah, Shane stole all my good ones. Um, Sorry. No, no. Uh, I, I, the, 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 the point about, about um, making your most important points early in your paper, I guess I, I, that's something I have long conversations with my advisees about in, in that it's not just papers, but also proposals, you know, because you're in the mode, sometimes you're in the mode of, of laying out all the background first, right? And then, and then saying, okay, here's what I'm going to do, or here's what I did. And, you know, that's a, that's a certain uh, a, a style of learning, a certain style of, of presenting. And that's really not what you want to do. I mean, you, you do, you, you have to do that. You have to lay out the, the, the important, you know the challenges and everything, and, and you know I'm talking about talking about papers and proposals here a little bit, just kind of blurring the lines a bit. But get it out there. If 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 I have to pour through your paper to figure out what you did, uh, echoing what, what these guys have already said, you know the beginning or the end. I like the beginning. You know here's what we did. Here's here's why it's important. Uh, a brief statement, and the same thing with a proposal. If you if I have to if I have to wade through uh, pages to figure out what you're going to do. Uh, you're not going to get funded because you don't really. I don't get a feeling that you really. Um, first of all, I don't have to. I don't have time to do that with every proposal. And secondly, it, 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 I get the sense that you don't really know what you want to do. So those are. I, I, I do that. I, I'd say that that's an important point for both. I think the other thing is to just to define your scope. You know, with paper, you want to tell your whole story. You you really do. I mean, and and you were there. You were there duking it out, you know, to the very end, and all the hard things that you did, you know, um, th this thing cannot read like, th this is not a chronological report. Again, this is not a report. Th this, you're, you, have, you have complete license, you know, once you've done the work, once it's been, you, you have complete license to tell it the way you want to, from the perspective you want to. And the way you don't want to tell it is, well, yeah, then, you, you, you know, don't make the reader feel your pain. You know, I mean, it is painful, right? The things that you guys are doing, you're going through that. That's how, that's how you get to graduate. That's why that, that, that you don't know this yet, but that's how we actually finally decide to give you a, a diploma is that we can kind of sense on your face, okay, that's enough pain. Uh, <laughs> but you don't, don't make every reader feel that, you know, you know, just act like you, you, know, you did it, you know, during a commercial, during the, the Super Bowl or something. I mean, but, 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 but really define your scope well. Don't tell the whole story. Don't have time. Not Everybody's not interested in that. Uh, just decide early on what the limits are. You know, you can, you can move, move things to another paper. And that's one of the things that often happens in, in the interactions I have with my advisees is that what's, what is the, again, it comes back to the, to the idea of a, of a story. You know, does, do, I have to, do I have to extend the story um, in a way that, that just really makes it untellable in order to, to to talk about these other points, or should they be in another paper by themselves? So scope. So again, I'll choose a completely different point. Uh, the different subjects in science today are organized somewhat differently. Perhaps there's a trend, perhaps not. When I uh, entered the public uh, publishing papers myself and became an editor, this is a long time ago, 
the number of journals in mathematics was incredibly limited. I would say that there were eight or nine altogether worldwide. And the, most of them were actually published by societies. And in the, when they're published by societies, the, the people who are editors uh, feel a duty to represent the entire field, like all of mathematics or all of differential geometry or all of, uh, uh, and, and nowadays, all of all, uh, uh, complexity theory or something of that sort. That's completely changed. The whole thing fragmented into where there are 100 separate journals, but that's not actually what I want to make the comment on. There's an, it's, we talk about journals, but you have to remember that everybody likes to be invited to meetings of their peers, of their very intelligent peers, the specialized math and scientific meetings. So what's happened in the meantime is that the first publications, which are supposed to be preliminary and therefore publishable in a journal record, they appear in meetings where people are invited, uh, not done by societies, and they're invited to represent a particular area. And usually at the beginning, it's your advisor who can get you into an invited meeting. But some of the invited ones are open in many fields, and you simply send in articles, and it's a competitive choice of an article. These are really preliminary articles. But if, for example, in computer science, which I represent just as much as uh, mathematics or applied mathematics, in, in computer science, the whole thing is to get your papers accepted in these very specialized meetings, which are in topics of, of current or past interest, and, and a past a, a, a very severe uh, board of examiners in the sense that, for example, in a typical CS or, or in fact, in the engineering uh, volumes that I've edited, you have 20 or 30 people and they fight it out, really, one at a time for each of the refereed papers, for each of the papers, whether that one is good enough to get in. You have to realize that the whole thing is broken up now into journals and uh, submissions to meetings and getting into the meetings and getting into the high prestige meetings. And so lo looking directly at the journals, at least in the subjects, which are quite varied, which I've been involved in, that's a very important thing. And so the mistake is to not to, um, this is not a mistake, the mistake is not to participate in this uh, uh, real change that's taken place. I mean, I'm of an age where none of this existed, so I see it very strongly and I sponsor such meetings. In fact, half of the things I've edited, maybe 20, 25 books, uh, were from meetings where I was trying to get people together to organize a part of the subject and get coherent research going. It's, there are a lot of those around science now. I mean, no, a Springer Fairlog has been an especial specialist in this. There's another warning which Raoul gave because I was up here and I heard it over here. The, the, the warning is that there are a lot of pseudo journals and there are also a lot of pseudo meetings and they come up on my website, uh, you know, as email every single day. Uh, they're not necessarily Chinese. They're from anybody who's trying to extract money for, uh, for giving an inferior publication. Just don't get involved in those in any way, shape, or form. So it's not just this, but what you get involved in is something where you recognize the person who's principal in sponsoring the thing and they're the organizing committee. Uh, a real mistake is to get involved in anything else. I'm just meandering on, so I'm stopping. <laughs> That's good advice. Thank you. Joel, could I just add one more thought to something? I just wanted to emphasize something that Matt said that I think was actually extremely important. So uh, proposals and papers. So making them skimmable would be my word. Yep. So somebody should be able to look at your paper, read the title, have a sense of what's going on, read the abstract, have a slightly better sense of what's going on, skim through the paper body itself. The, the section headings should be things that actually tell you something useful, not results but actually something that tell you, tell you something useful so that you can skim through this paper. You get a good sense of how the paper is organized, what's in each section, and, and what is the contribution. And that same comment applies to the, the detailed text as well. So you might think of it as sort of this hierarchical thing where you're sort of gradually zooming in on the paper. And many people will never read every word in that paper. Most people will only read the title. Some will read the abstract. A few more will read the introduction and a very small fraction will actually read every line of that paper. 
So keep that in mind as you're writing and, and think about this hierarchical approach to designing your, your presentation. I like that word. I think skimmable is a good, a good uh, way to think about it. I, I can't resist um, jumping back in, but this has nothing to do with getting papers accepted. It's reading them. I start at the end. I want to find out what the people thought that they were doing. I tend to work back. This is math papers, computer science papers, and the theoretical engineering papers. I work back. It's much faster because you can abandon all the papers absolutely immediately. You don't have to go off. What's the punchline? Yeah. yeah. So the next question I have up here is, what is your view of metrics or impact factor of journals and authors and its importance? So uh, yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll go for that one. Um, I'm actually not a big fan of uh, of most most metrics. I find, um, for example, many of them are related to uh, citations in the last. Uh, X years, where X is some small number. And in my field, at least, we tend to be very, very slow at journals in terms of getting things uh, from, uh, well, through the editorial process and then published. And by the time something is published, it's been a few years. The conference version of the paper has been out for a few years, and that's the one that tends to get cited more. And so the usual metrics that are related to citations in the last X years are, are pretty much irrelevant. The key thing is actually something that Anil said earlier, who is on the editorial board? That's the biggest indicator of quality. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't have a lot to say except that, you know, we we as a um, uh, as a, uh, a, a, a a society of scholars. I mean, we're we're constantly looking for for ways to um, uh, uh, looking for metrics. And you know we're also running out of time. You know we have, we have our, our days are are are, are, are packed. Uh, I'm not I'm not saying that we work harder than people did in the past, but we're looking for, for numbers, right? So it's it's I can literally you know if I can if I it, this and this kind of goes beyond the scope a little bit in that if I can if I can sum some a, a person up by their H index, well, well that's great, right? I mean I, I, everybody's just a number. Well, I, I, yeah, uh, I think that that. The, you know, the, the, the care taken to understand what all that means is still really important because it does, just because we can do it fast doesn't mean we could, we're doing it well. And so I, I, I uh, in, in terms of looking at the impact factor when I'm thinking about publication, uh, I'll probably notice it, but I, I agree with these guys. I think that you, 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 you look for the, uh, is this the, um, is this the, um, the community that you want to uh, uh, be discussing this is this is this the right community, and it's often dictated by the editors. And again, that's a that's a that's a that's something that your advisor is more than happy probably to help you with. I, I would say don't if if somebody's saying hey do that on your own, okay. Uh, but that's sort of I feel I feel like that's part of my role. Part of my role is to help my students understand uh, what. Uh, you know where they're where they're, they they can possibly have impact, and what you know what what the disciplines are because we you know we live in a, in a very multidisciplinary world, and uh, yet we kind of try to continue to pull ourselves down into these into these places where there's their individual disciplines, um, and that's a that's that's a tricky business. That's that's what you know some of the scars are that you have as a as a as an advisor and as a as a as a uh, an academic in general. So. That's that's what I feel. I'm part of how I earn my money. So that ought to be something that you should not, uh, you should never um, uh, feel awkward or embarrassed about act, asking your advisor for help. So I have a super negative uh, reaction to these uh, cita these they cite index citations. The reason is that I think they were invented for deans and for the people who are giving out money from national foundations. The idea there is to cause them, those people as little work as possible so that they can look at a number instead of what the work was. And I'm much prejudiced. I've, I've worked on all these national committees for 50 years. Uh, I really feel it's intended to eliminate work for people who don't want to do any. Or, or if, if somebody's put in charge of a fellowship program or a national grants program who really has got a very limited intellectual horizon and can evaluate the number three versus the number four, but couldn't possibly have 
evaluated their verbal uh, description of the projects. And I just think it's been bad for science. It's just what happens when you do enough things in a very massive way. So I'm very negative on it. Good, thank you. Okay, and then here's our last question. And we can take questions from the audience. Let's move now to conference presentations. Do you have any tips for people on how they can present better conference presentations? Do you have examples of really bad conference presentations that are in your mind that sometimes tips on that will help us? Okay, you're the leader. You're the leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, fantastic Sorry, guys, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pinching all the good stuff, yeah. So uh, this is actually a bit of a favorite theme of mine, and so I apologize to a couple of folks who have heard me say this uh, an infinite number of times. Uh, I think that uh, presenting your own work at a conference is an incredibly nerve-wracking experience, certainly pre-tenure, right? So it's, it's, it's very, very, very frightening. And, and so I think that it's important that you do develop some kind of strategy to deal with the nerves that you will feel. So uh, I think probably the biggest one for me, and this is just a total mind game, is I like to present the work, not my work, the work. So what I mean by that is I'm distancing myself from the work that I'm presenting. I sort of discovered this mind trick when I was asked to present somebody else's slides. I, was, I had organized a session and my friend couldn't make it to the conference, so he said, here's my stuff, can you present it for me please? And I was like, whoa, that's gonna be something. So mm -hmm. I presented somebody else's work and did the best I could. And when I came up, you know, when questions came that I had no clue on, I just said, I have no clue, ask the author. And so it was an incredibly liberating experience. And so by, by just translating that across. So when you're presenting the work, you're presenting the work, it's this object over here. And when people ask you questions, you're far less defensive if you've adopted that mindset. So if somebody says, isn't that assumption a very, very strong assumption? You know, if, if you're really caught up in this, you might say, uh, 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 and start tripping over yourself. <laughs> the other way to deal with that is to say, yes, that's a really strong assumption, but look what it allows us to do. And so by distancing yourself from the work when you're presenting it, you can maybe offer a more neutral presentation. You're still championing your work, but you're, you're offering it in a far less defensive manner. Uh, the second thing I would like to offer is that, uh, at least in my community, we've managed to uh, reduce dramatically the jerk factor uh, at conferences. So there are very few people in my community who will stand up or, or put their hand up and say, wasn't this done in 1922? Um, and why are you wasting our time with this now? <coughs> that almost does not exist in my community. And I have been present in presentations where something like that has come up. And uh, as, a, as somebody who's probably more senior in that field now, I feel very comfortable in sort of maybe defending the speaker a little bit in real time, and then also approaching that person who was the jerk afterwards and, and saying to them, look, you could have made an equivalent comment after the talk and not given this person a hard time. So I would hope, I, I don't have the experience, but I would hope that your community has such people. And if they don't, you should just make sure that in any of your talks, your advisor should be present or somebody who respects your work, so that if you do encounter such a person, there's somebody in that audience who will uh, have your back. Good. Um, so uh, I would, the um, thing that I've, uh, one thing I've noticed about my own presentations is that um, I think early on, I would make the slides, of course, not you know you, you, you literally make them back in, in, in age-wise. It's you know you, you you didn't have the you didn't have the, the opportunity to change your slides in real time. You know, sitting listening to the talk before you, uh, I, I'd, I'd advise against that. By the way, um, but when you had to actually print them out and then that you were stuck with them, that was uh, that was a uh, you were in a better uh, I think you were, you were in a better place, but. I think I, I when I first started in this business, you know, I, I think I'm I think I'm pretty I'm a pretty good BSer, you know. So I think I can get up and talk, and I can I can sort of I can I can just sort of flow into it. I mean, you're you're witnessing it maybe right now that I can just BS. Uh, and I used to that's how I used to give talks. I'd have I'd have some points there, and then I would I would decide that okay I will I'll, I'll kind of decide how I want to talk around those. 
And as I've gone on, as I've, my, my talks are more and more scripted, almost literally. I, I will almost say, you know, I, I will go through and, 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 and on each slide. The, the, and the, I guess the other point, an accompanying point is, don't have anything more than, than maybe two, maybe three takeaways from every slide. Like if you've got 15 things that you want people really to understand, uh, rethink that. You know, again, I, I've, I've harped on this several, my, a lot of my comments have had to do with scope. You know, what are you gonna really talk about? What would you really like for them to take away? You want them to take away everything? You really want them to know about all the, you know, this is consistent with what I said earlier. Um, but I, now I, I, I almost script my entire, you know, every talk because I know I am a BSer and I, I will take off and start talking about something on slide four and all of a sudden now that the session chair is standing up and I've got two minutes left and my most important slide is still back there because I kind of, I got a wild hair and decided to talk about this thing, you know. So I've just, I've had to almost just impose a lot more discipline on myself to make sure I get to the points that I want to make. And I don't want to come up with those in real time. So make sure that you get to the points that you want to make on every slide. You think you have them, you know, with your, your words and your, and your figures and everything. But those, again, those, those, you're, you're there for a reason. You know, if, if, if your slides would do it all, we would just, you know, pass slides around and we would, we would have a lot less travel. You know, but but you're there giving that talk for a reason. So have your have those three you know slides uh, ready to go, and then uh, you know have some in your pocket for the you know I I am in a I'm in a, uh, a there's still some interesting personalities in my in, in some of the meetings that I go to, and I I you know use the word interesting person you know it's, it's, it's kind of consistent with what what Shane's talking about. And, you know, have some slides, have a, have, a, have a few slides in your pocket, right, at the end of your talk. Always have some things that you can, you can use for discussion. And maybe one of your friends is out there that'll actually ask the right question and, and then why well, you can really look smart. But, you know, I, I think that um, um, uh, having, you know, a well-defined talk, but then have some extra stuff that, that can maybe come up during question and answer, that's, that, that really does, I, I'm always impressed by that when somebody has that slide that that was exactly the question that was that was sort of created in a, by an earlier slide. I really like the fact that they had that slide. That, that always makes me think they're really super smart. Well, uh, when I went to mathematics lectures or lectures in the related engineering disciplines very early on, the slides were really busy. But now some conferences still have slides that are really busy where there's line after line of stuff and if you're not reading it you're maybe summarizing it i changed my own style completely due to the uh, way in which computer science evolved the rule there which i think is a very good one is no more than six lines per slide and they should be in a, a typeface that's large not small that enforces a complete discipline to get everything across very briefly. So my own advice, if you don't even think about it further, is to limit yourself to slides that people can read in a few seconds, which means six lines per slide plus a picture, which doesn't have to be explained. That's sort of a, just a rule of thumb, which I now use. And it's exactly the opposite of what I was doing and all my colleagues were doing a long time ago. That's actually a very important point. It's it's very uh, because it's so nerve wracking. Uh, it's tempting to put everything on that slide so you you know that you can always just have that stuff at your fingertips. And that's exactly the wrong way to go. Yep. You're, you're, you're Except that some people have these hidden slides where if somebody asks that question, you click on it and there the extra slide comes <laughs> up explaining it. That's a lot of work. <laughs> well, that that's Matt's jam anyway, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so. So yeah, just having the highlights on the slides, and if you if you do want that you know additional backup information, have it on a piece of paper down in front of you, or or on another computer in front of you, so that you can you can sort of track what's going on. PowerPoint does this very nicely with you know you have the the, the stuff that's on the on the alternative alternative screen, and then you have a sort of a private screen in front of you for your notes. Um, I'm not a huge fan of PowerPoint, but it's the right tool sometimes, and but that's a great principle that that idea of having some private stuff. So. So that way you're not diverted, you know, uh, to, to having every every piece of information ever on the slide. 
if you're presenting numerical results, having enormous tables of, of information is useless because people just can't see the patterns in real time. So you have to help them maybe by presenting information visually. With the presenter's notes, I, I would say that uh, I love them, love to have, but there are sometimes, you know, you, you think that, that connectivity with projectors, we should, we should be getting better at it. I think we're going the, the, the other way mm -hmm. in terms of being able to uh, think that you can go up and, and hook your, your laptop up to and, and have it work. It's, I think, it, I don't, I think it's getting worse. So if you, I think having the presenter's notes is awesome. And I, I completely echo what, what Shane said, but if you're depending on those, if you have to have those to give your talk, that's a, that's a problem because you don't want to be up there arguing with the session chair and using, you know, two or three of your minutes trying to get your laptop up and going because your the clock is running. And if you've got to do it with a, you know, with a flashlight through that, you, you've got to, you've got to, you're, you're not going to get a second chance. They're not going to say, well, okay, we'll give you, because that is, you know, the, 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 that, that they don't, you know, you, you, maybe they'll move you to another session and nobody knows where you are. Say well, maybe you can you can have the uh, the, the talk at the end of this uh, session. That's not what you want. You got you got your 15 minutes. You got your 20 minutes. Give it however you got to give it. And and even if they if it, even if it's their fault, you know if if the if the uh, if if the projector's not you know give your talk somehow. Get your talk out there. So um, yeah, I mean I, I I just just you know it's so you know. For no other reason than you're just causing so much pain to the people. They're they're watching you, you know, and you're kind of young and you're, you're trying to get it all going. And uh, so you know, have 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 something, have a have a kind of a bulletproof way. I mean, like I will have. Um, I don't. I use Keynote a lot, but if if for some reason I can't hook my computer up to it, I, I'll always have on a on a flat on a on a thumb drive. PDF version of that, right? So you can just plug it into any computer. So I, I still do that. I used to do it, you know, when we were transitioning from overhead to uh, to you know this. Um, I would always print, you know, you, you print a copy. Okay, uh, then I have, I still have a printed copy. Well, I'm still, I haven't quite gone that way because you won't hit there are very few overheads anymore <laughs> in these sessions. But uh, I usually carry around a PDF with my presentation that that should work on any computer. It's nice to have the cool movies and everything, but but uh, you 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 will not get you will not get that time back. Good, thank you. Well, we have some time for questions. Does anyone have a question for one of our panelists? Yeah. Yeah, give it a shot. Um, so I, that may be a, a field specific issue. Uh, in the journals in which uh, uh, I publish, the intros have been swelling over the years, so <laughs> that, that's actually the place to do it. So how does your work relate to what other people are doing? You know, that's a sort of a first order issue, so it comes in the introduction for us. But that means that introductions can be fairly long. Uh, I just try, again, make the introduction skimmable as well, right, so people can find what they're looking for. You can break out a second, sec I mean, you, uh, again, depending upon the topic and the, and the, and the, the uh, journal, uh, you. Sometimes there'll be an introduction and then maybe another, other, another section called background. I mean, I, I don't, I, I, there are times where I'll do both of those or have a student do both of those. And those are two different things. Intro being more, you know, kind of your, your uh, you know, getting that, getting what you're doing, getting that, the, the, the skimmable part done. And then the background, again, I don't, I don't think that's going to be something that some people are going to really want to skim too much. They're going to just want to know that you, understand what's been done. So I'll, I'll sometimes do that. So my only comment is that uh, when you put an article in a journal, you can't expect most of the readers of the journal to have any interest in it whatsoever, even if it's a contribution to their field. That's your only chance for advertising. The introduction advertises you 
because people go through the journals reading the introductions. So if you actually want to get well known in your field at an early stage, make understandable introductions that say something that to a general audience. And I don't care if the paper gets uh, shorter because of the compaction, compacting it at the end. The technicians will always, always read the compact version. We put enough at the beginning so that the person opening the journal cares to look, read the damn thing. Other questions? I have a question. <laughs> so uh, how do you write your paper? Where do you start? You know, there's a, there's a, this one that'll get some fights going. What's the, what's the, what's the, what's the recipe? Oh, up here. Yeah. Who said that? One of my students. No. So I think that I can't, I'm, I'm very philosophically inclined, for which I apologize. There are two different things here. One is the order of discovery, in which case you write the things down in notebooks and so on and fill them out to be sure they're right and erase the parts that really don't belong there. And the other is the order of exposition, where you look at the order in which the ideas can be presented. And those are completely separate things. One comes first, the other comes afterwards. They're not the same. Somebody says start with the figures, though. I guess that's that's usually someplace I'll I'll send my students, and then you know you can think of writing the story around it. I, I like that as a beginning. Also, to not have to not have to, to to wait to the end to really talk about conclusions, you know, because that's or to, to, or to write a write a paper front to back. That, that, that's a that's an interesting approach, but I, I don't necessarily do that. Um, but what 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 do you conclude, right? And so, getting an idea about what those are early on is probably important. I think we had a question back there. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, let's say you have a paper rejected. <laughs> How do you decide where to send that next? If you have that initial list of where you decide to send it, what feedback that you receive do you use to shape that decision? Is there ever a situation where you send it back? Yeah, I, I have an infinite amount of experience with rejections. So uh, it's, it's actually almost true. Um, a lot, anyway. So, uh, so I think you, you're you're constantly thinking, who do you want to read the paper? Right. That's that's really how you're choosing the journal. So, who's the audience, uh, and and where do you expect that to go? If the um, if the the reports have come back and it's really pretty clear that they've closed the door on this particular journal then yeah, you have to move on. And so you will think, okay, so what other journals are out there that publish very similar work to this? And, and it's just a fact of life that this will happen. Um, I'm not a fan of the create your priority list at the start and then just work your way down the list, right? So that I don't think is the goal uh, or the, the right approach. I, th I think you do want to think carefully about uh, the audience. Uh, occasionally, I have gone back to the same journal after I've sort of considerably rewritten the paper um, as a new submission. So, uh, so the and, and and but I'm very much upfront whenever I do that. So I'll say, you know, here's the previous paper with the reports from the previous paper, and here's what I've done, and here's why I think it's appropriate for the paper to be reconsidered. Uh, sometimes I've done that where where maybe some uh, referees have missed something pretty vital in the initial submission, uh, but that's really on me because I didn't make it uh, as clear as perhaps I should. So, uh, so I think it's occasionally okay to go back to the same journal, but I think it's pretty unusual. And um, and really, it's all about the audience. I'm just thinking about that. I, um, I tell people when I reject their papers where I think they'll get an acceptance. That's the best I can say. Or not to publish it at all, which I'm quite brutal about if that's the case. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> So uh, you know, research is a very complicated process. Right? So sometimes we, a lot of times, we didn't uh, get what we expected. Some just failed, or sometimes just very trivial problems. Right? So at which point do you think we need to write up this? Is, is the right time to write up? When really, when you think that there's an audience for it. In other words, you do not wish to put in papers that nobody's going to read. You have to think that there's some people who are interested in. 
we can't tell you when that is. Maybe if I can add to that. So I, I'm a big fan of maintaining a portfolio of, of projects, a portfolio of different uh, items on which you're working, and, uh, and constantly striving to go for the uh, most interesting or impactful or fun, right? Uh, what's the thing that, that uh, you think will drive that interest most? And so shortest, work, work on the project that has the sort of, is closest to completion. In my field, we call this shortest remaining processing time. So shortest remaining processing time on interesting, important, fun projects. But you do need to maintain a portfolio so that you actually have a choice, right? Because if you don't have a choice, pretty clear what, you, what you're gonna work on. And so uh, that's hard to get going when you're first getting underway with research. And that's just a fact, right? It's just gonna be the case that you've got your first effort with your advisor. And so you, I, I think it's important to, to, to do a lot of brainstorming and to create a, a, a portfolio of ideas. Uh, as early as you possibly can. I guess I didn't, talk, I, maybe I didn't understand the question. Are you asking um, if, if what you've done doesn't work? Um, yeah, we always have something to improve. Like right. Some small or some very uh, big uh, discovery. Right? So uh -huh. each point which you are confident yeah, I, uh, yeah, the, like when, um, yeah, I would agree, it's like when you think you have something, um, because you, you know, if you, it's never finished, right? You, you could, you'd write one paper at the end of your career and say, okay, here it is. Um, and so you have to. <laughs> your end of your career would come pretty early, I think. Yeah, well, it, it, it just keeps running away. Um, the, um, again, I, I think that's, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing that as part of my job as an advisor. I think that, that that's, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to help you sort of build some of those, uh, 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 you know, we, we, we'd like for them to be instincts, right? Like they just know, I know. Well, okay, but just, just like, just like probably the very worst thing that can ever happen is if something worked the first time, you know, like experimentally, if, 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 if it works the first time, ugh. You know, I, I, that, you know, you you learn that that's probably the kiss of death. There's probably something wrong, you know, and you're not seeing it, you know, because you, you, we learn from our mistakes, all that kind of stuff, right? It's so, and so it's like, um, uh, and the real, you know, that's the cool thing about university research is that you start down sort of a general path, and then you, you're able to go, you know, do your thing, right? You're you're supposed to be this, you're supposed to be the expert uh, at the end of this, and and um, how are you going to carve out something that everybody else is working on? So we learn from our mistakes. We get that. That's, that's, that's where the interesting stuff happens. Um, but the, um, so you can't, but you can't make that into it. You can't make, well, it didn't work. And there's, there's my paper. Right. And so that's, it, I think that's an experience thing. And so I, I, that th those are conversations I enjoy having with my, my students. In, if I may chime in, in, in a, in astronomy, uh, sometimes you get observing time from the European Southern Observatory and you do your observations and you get new intentions or upper limits. And a condition for getting new observing time is that you publish your previous observations. And so if it is not, if you think it's not worth it, then mm -hmm. you're in a situation like, well, what do I do with yeah. this? Uh, and I stick it in something that I was working on. Uh, so that's from one field, that's a predicament that you can be in. I mean, there's also a different aspect which we haven't spent very much time on. Uh, for this, it's an anecdote that I want to give. When I first entered mathematics graduate school, uh, a famous mathematician named Paul Halmus in the first course for orientation with the students, started it out by saying, mathematics is a social science. And what he meant was you learn more from the people in your peer group than you do from the professors or from reading things. So the different answer to your question is, you can publish at the point where you can get some of your friends to say, yes, this was an interesting thing that I've done. And also just don't forget that the peer group counts for a lot. That's where you learn all the new stuff. 
And somehow we're talking about publication rather than the advance of science, which is often done because of the fact that groups of people talk to each other and they have different insights. You don't have to be mediated by journals for that. That's what the emails is useful for at the present time, which does play, as you all know, a very great role in active research groups at this point. And we, we left it out. So, so maybe, uh, I have no idea how to solve your astronomy problem. <laughs> that, that, one's, that one's really brutal, so I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think there's always another journal out there that, to which you can send work of, very, of varying qualities. And the question is whether it's worth your time, I think, if you've got a result that you really feel is kind of low on the totem pole, um, is it worth your time? Now, I, I, I think, again, maintain that portfolio, try to aim for the, the things that are at the top of your, of your pecking order. Um, but if you've actually hit some sort of quiet period where you're down the bottom, well, maybe publish it, but just think about your own reputation amongst your community. And will people be, be glad that you've published that paper? If not, you need to, you need to just say, you know, sunk cost, move on. Um, but, but the other thought here is that we all tend to, you know, we all tend to read the better papers in our field. Right? That's where we're going to focus our time. And that creates a sort of a weird perception bias because the journals are publishing this, this spectrum of activity. If we're all mostly reading the upper half uh, of that journal, we get this perception that that's what all papers look like. It's not what all papers look like. There's this whole other side. And so um, giving yourself a little bit uh, of confidence that there, there, you know, your paper doesn't have to change the, change the field, or well, not every one of your papers has to change the field. You, you, you want to you want to publish quality stuff, and quality means the whole spectrum of stuff that appears in journals. Uh, what about going to conferences and asking people about do you think this work is worth publishing? Like, is that a good idea or no? You need to have an answer to that question yourself. Um, definitely get to those conferences. Yeah, definitely. But but you need to be able to answer that question for yourself. Um, if you feel like work is you're you're not sure if it's worth uh, publishing. I would ask it, but I would ask it in a slightly different way. Yeah. yeah. What did you think of my talk? Embrace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, and again, I, I would be be careful too. I have colleagues that basically are looking for bright young faces that they're kind of wanting to hear what they're up to. So, I, I, and again, I, I, it's, it, 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 you know, you have some great ideas. Don't don't hand them to someone. You know that that, that kind of Again, the, the conference presentation thing is also really important about, about is, it, is it published? Is it, is it at a place that you're, because I, I guess it would be great if it weren't the case, but now, um, you know, every, people are taking pictures of your slides, right? And, they, and, and again, the conferences are, are trying to uh, make that not happen. It happens all the time. And so the ability, the ability for someone to, to swipe your ideas has never been more uh, uh, it, it's never been more rife with that. I, I don't, you don't want to approach, don't approach the field that way. Like, oh, but, but think of your ideas as being, okay, these are pretty good, you know, and I, I want to be careful about how I, how I ask those questions and how I share those things. I, I, that's what I would say. It's that you've thought about these things a long time. Don't let somebody who's thought about them five minutes swipe them from you and get there because they have a name, they can get it published first. It happens all the time. So, I guess the balance here is establishing precedents, maybe by putting some, something on archives, uh, mm -hmm. but, but also being careful not to put stuff out there publicly for which you're not, you know, really confident it's your best work. That's, that's always a trade-off. I don't know how to balance that. Well, I think for small selective conferences, you get enough feedback after your lecture without after being embarrassed by having to ask. So the, the first, the first uh, sort of form of query would be the non-understandable question, 
And, and I think we've all encountered those. And that's usually because the questioner doesn't have a crisp idea in their mind. So it's perfectly okay to sort of rephrase what you think the question was. And then, is that your question? You know, and if that's not, give, it, give them another shot at it. And if it's still not coming out, you might just say, look, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not quite with you. Let's take that one offline. And, and that's usually because the questioner has not formulated a good question. It's not on you. Uh, it's extremely rare, I think, that you would be asked a question that you don't understand in your own presentation. You know your work better than anybody probably in the world, and so you should feel com confident that you know that, that space and you know the kinds of questions that, that make sense. For the second, uh, maybe that's hard, hard to absorb, but I, I do believe that is true. I, we have people in our department who ask the world's worst questions. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and we've sort of come to appreciate that and sort of intercept at various times in talks. Uh, for the second question where somebody's trying to actually actively undermine you, um, I, I don't know. That one, that one is tough. I think you have to sort of stand on your own science and, and do your best and, and not, again, try to avoid that defensive trap. So the more defensive you become up there, the worse it's going to be. So you, you, you might end up saying, well, these are my results. Um, perhaps we can talk afterwards to try to resolve any uh, discrepancy. Very, very difficult situation. It doesn't really arise too much in my field. I, I would really echo what Shane said in terms of make sure that make sure that the question that you're answering is the one that has been asked. Because I, I again, I was speaking from my own experience. I will, I will almost immediately go on the defensive, and I, and I, and I, I, I you know, you, you, you assume that you're being asked something that. Is questioning, you know, your whole career, not just, you know, and you know, go, okay, well, I don't have to take it. So, so listen carefully, and uh, or or I start formulating the answer, you know, after the first couple of words, right? Okay, that. Uh, so make sure. I, I think that the idea of, of actually going back and asking them to rephrase that that helps a lot. That that's a that's a that's a good way to. Uh, and, and, and make it sound like, hey, it's my fault. I, I probably wasn't listening very well. Can you, can you say that in, you know, in a different way or something? I think that's a, that's a really good approach. Uh, and then if they are, if they're really going after you, I mean, um, you know, I guess maybe just physical stature wise, I'll usually just go after them and beat them up. I mean, that's, that's what I do. So, I mean, I, I can maybe not everybody can get away with that. But that's what I, I usually just grab them and start shaking them. <laughs> but I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. So I have a completely different approach, which I have actually used. But I've used it for several things. One is for questions which are simply out of this world and where you may, may be talking to a complete nut or questions where they don't understand what field that you're actually representing, you know, things that are weird, but also for people who are contentious, which is to say, thank you very much for your question. That's very interesting. We'll talk about it afterwards. And if they continue talking, don't say a word. I'm just talking about psychology, nothing else. Great. Well, we're, I'd like uh, everyone to give our panel a round of applause. And thank you.